professor of English from UBCC. Thank you so much for attending tonight's screening and panel discussion. It is an honor and a privilege for QB to be collaborating with Eastern on this very important community event. Well, then Hines, John Anderson, and I would like to thank President Kelly Drummer, Jennifer Green, Marla Hoppe, Susan Moreau, Michael Lynch, LIR, QBCC faculty and staff who offered their support, Bob Middle College, Principal Gino Rico, uh, EastCon, ACT Principal Sarah Malore, ACT Teachers Dan Bovert, Barbara Greenbaum, radio host Wayne Norman, and June Dunn from Eastern. <coughs> Stacey Coles, the Associate uh, Vice President of Equity University at Eastern Connecticut State University and also a uh, professor of history. Uh, on behalf of Dr. Elsa Nunez, I bring you greetings from Eastern Connecticut State University. Uh, Dr. Nunez couldn't attend this evening, but she asked me to uh, bring our most heartfelt greetings and thanks to uh, President Carly Drummer and the uh, colleagues at Puerto Rico Community College for giving us an opportunity to participate in the program and also to that magnet. Uh, to uh, Professor John Anderson uh, for uh, helping to organize this wonderful event, to my colleague Dr. Lewis Matthews and other committee members at Eastern who took, took part in our discussions on campus, and also uh, uh, to June Dunn for helping to coordinate much of the day-to-day -day work that we do. Uh, to the students here who are in attendance, I thank you for coming out on this uh, slightly rainy and wet evening uh, to get the document and also to hear from our panelists. Uh, Professor uh, Sean Frederick Forbes, Dr. Reginald Flood of Eastern, and also uh, Karen Thorson, uh, our award winning writer and filmmaker, uh, who has given us an opportunity to uh, glimpse into the life of uh, the legendary, wonderful James Baldwin. Uh, Eastern is delighted to be here tonight and we're really <coughs> excited about the very uh, enjoyable evening we're about to have. Thank you very much. series of events. Um, so uh, our, our panelists, and then we'll get to the discussion, and there will be a time for audience participation. We would like the, to, this to be partially a community dialogue. Um, this is part of a, a bigger program called Conversations with Jimmy, um, and, and so uh, we're here to have a conversation. So when we get to that portion, if you want to speak, uh, there's a microphone on the stand, you'll notice, right over here, and you can just step up to that microphone to, uh, to ask your question or, or make your statement. Uh, so first of all, uh, Stacy Close, Dr. Close, uh, PhD, uh, is joining us. Um, he is, what is a, a highly regarded and, and a very popular um, uh, history professor at Eastern Connecticut State University, He's currently serving as the Associate Vice President for Equity and, Di and Diversity uh, at the university. He's published in a number of journals. Uh, he's a contributing editor and essayist for African Americans in Connecticut Explored, which was published by uh, Wesleyan University Press, uh, where he uh, had, a, had a fellowship there. Over here, all the way over to the right, is uh, Professor of English uh, Reginald Flood. Um, Dr. Flood is a native of South Central Los Angeles and now lives in uh, a small town in Connecticut with his family. I'll talk about Psychic Leap, perhaps. Um, he, and uh, he is a poet. He's a Cave Canem Fellow, 
um, his uh, book of poems, Cawthel, if you can get a hold of that, I, I highly recommend that, uh, which was published by Willow Books in, in 2012. Uh, next to Dr. Flood is Dr. Sean Frederick Forbes, who is currently the associate um, or the uh, acting um, director of the creative writing program at the University of Connecticut. Uh, he's published uh, poetry and has written uh, critical work uh, that deals with identity and uh, has, a, um, I'm sure, will bring a very good perspective to this program. He, too, is a poet. Uh, we're, we're everywhere, actually. And, um, and uh, his first book of poems is Providencia, which was published in, two, in, in uh, 2013. Um, and uh, last but certainly not least, uh, directly to my right is Karen Thorson. Uh, and you've seen her name. She is a, a filmmaker along with her, along with her husband. Um, she's an award-winning writer and filmmaker. Actually, yeah, where is Douglas? Let's see if you do with the camera. With the camera right? <laughs> so, um, uh, uh, Karen uh, finds inspiration at the intersection of art and social justice. I think that this this project uh, of conversations with Jimmy and what she's done with this film, and what Douglas has done with this film, James Baldwin would certainly, certainly approve of. She graduated from Vassar College, um, eventually finding her way from writing to uh, filmmaking, um, uh, much to the benefit of all of us. So uh, with that, uh, um, let's, begin, let's begin the program. I'm going to ask the, the question, the question of the night, which will probably go in, in various directions. Um, but the question that I'm going to pose to the panelists and ask each of them to answer briefly in five minutes or under is this. What can we learn from James Baldwin's legacy that can inform our fight for social justice, our fight against racism, our fight for equality today? And so, actually, I'd like to begin with uh, Sean Forbes. Um, and Sean, if you could, if you could go from there. Sure. How is this? Very good. Too much feedback, or is it okay? <laughs> Use the mic. Okay. Just wanted to make sure. So, the way I answered this question was um, by thinking about narrative, um, and this is perhaps one of the most essential aspects of Baldwin's legacy to me as a gay writer of color. It's the idea of if you do not have any children as a gay person, what do you leave behind to your family, to your friends? What do you leave behind after you have gone on? And I think this is very crucial for James Baldwin himself. He was a writer who pushed himself and his craft constantly. Within his narratives, I think any reader can pose important questions for him or herself. When Baldwin passed away in 1987, I was six years old. But what I'm going to do is basically give you some narrative premises in terms of like a, a chronology of the way I'm reacting to not only the documentary, but also to James Baldwin's life and his writings. I grew up in a predominantly African-American neighborhood in Southside Jamaica, Queens. And a very uh, close family friend by the name of William C. Gray, who was black and one of the few in the neighborhood who religiously read the New York Times every day. He had worked as a promoter for the Cotton Club in his late teens and early 20s and was someone who worked closely with the civil rights leaders in New York City in the 1960s. Mr. Bill, as he was affectionately known, cut out Baldwin's obituary for me and told me that one day when I am older I should read Baldwin's work. I smiled and thanked him because I was a kind little six-year-old. At home, I placed the clipping in a folder and forgot about it. So, 1998, I'm 17, a senior in high school working on my senior honors thesis in which I have chosen to write about Giovanni's room, specifically about gay identity and the question of whether or not Baldwin is addressing matters of race if the characters in the novel are white. While I loved reading and rereading the novel and thinking endlessly about the characters and their complex individual situations in trying to formulate my thesis, I was experiencing my own personal struggles. I got a B plus on the paper. I wish I could say I was a child prodigy, but I really was not. And my teacher wrote, the argument is strong but needs more development and complexity. Her comments spoke to me personally 
because in that moment I was questioning my own sexuality and coming to terms with my racial and ethnic background. I grew up understanding that I was a mixed race, but that in itself seemed to evade further questioning. 2001. I'm cleaning my childhood room with a vengeance because my extended family and I are moving to another town in Queens and I find the obituary clipping. At six years old, three paragraphs seems to be a lot of text, but at 20 years old it's not enough text for someone of Baldwin's renown. Here are a few excerpts from the New York Times obituary published on December 20th, 1987. It's titled, James Baldwin, His Voice Remembered. Baldwin's insistent, passionate voice as an essayist, novelist, and playwright helped to inform and transform the debate on civil rights for Afro-Americans. His deeply generous spirit nourished a generation of writers, black and white, who benefited from his personal warmth and were inspired by the incisive, articulate anger that distinguished his writings. It's interesting because some people in different leagues can use articulate to refer to a person of color. So I was interested in the way that language is used in this particular obituary. Furthermore, the obituary states, his first novel, Go Tell It on the Mountain, was published in 1953. At least partly autobiographical, it depicts a poor boy's coming of age in the 1930s, Harlem, and the boy's conflict with his tyrannical father, a minister. But it was Baldwin's essay collections, Notes of a Native Son, published in 1955, Nobody Knows My Name, 1961, and The Fire Next Time, 1963, that thrust him into the spotlight as an intellectual spokesman for the civil rights movement. It was a title he consistently rejected. He often said he wrote simply to, quote, bear witness to the truth, unquote. There was no mention of Baldwin's being gay. No mention of Giovanni's Room, 1956, or Another Country, 1962, or Tell Me How Long the Train's Been Gone, 1968, all pertaining to characters that are either homosexual or bisexual. And the male protagonists who express difficulty in understanding their sexuality and in finding their own voice and in their own sense of self. <coughs> Excuse me. How were these omissions, quote, bearing witness to the truth of Baldwin's life and his writings and his voice. Clearly I understood the context of the obituary was to emphasize how vocal Baldwin had been during the Civil Rights Movement. He was indeed one of the first to cry out, to speak up, but it made me think of this question. How exactly can Baldwin's voice be remembered if the whole truth of his life and writings were elided? 2015. John Anderson politely asks me if I would be on this panel. And so I acquiesced and said yes. And so for the past 14 years, I've reread Baldwin's novels and have watched Karen Thorson's documentary, The Price of the Ticket. And the one word that I'm most drawn to when thinking about Baldwin and his legacy is narrative. The ways in which one lives to tell the tale, whether it be a novel or essay form. In the documentary, there's a scene in which Baldwin is being interviewed about Giovanni's room being published and the set subject of homosexuality during a time when being openly gay in the 1950s came with the huge legal and, legal and social ramifications. He states, I had no secrets. Nobody could blackmail me because I told you. Amiri Baraka offers another glimpse into Baldwin's homosexuality by stating he didn't hide his sexuality nor proclaim it. He was what he was. He lived. He said yes to life. Baldwin understood that a narrative has the ability and power to challenge and emotionally affect the reader and potentially to affect social and political change. If we think about the character of David in Giovanni's room, he is someone who could not make up his mind, someone who is bereft with constant guilt, someone who could not say yes to life. Fundamentally, Baldwin understood that one's mind is being programmed every single day. In present day, we're constantly influenced by the media, one's peers, and of course through various social media outlets. At any given moment, there is some suggestion that is dropped, or to use Paulo Freire's 
term banked into one's consciousness. If left to the majority, one would continue to be programmed as a minority, as a lesser to the majority, experiencing all of the pain and degradation that comes with this designation. Baldwin felt this pain of programming and sought to awaken himself and the reader. He didn't just cultivate art, he used his talent to cultivate a message and to leave this message in the reader's hands. Baldwin's life and writings can inform us in so many ways. He was a writer who in his novels and essays piled darkness upon darkness then blasted the reader with brightness, a glimpse of hope, one that we can all aspire to. He was also a man who was criticized and judged harshly by his contemporaries. He felt estranged, but he resigned himself to his work as a means of vindication because he understood that, and this is a direct quote from him, that any real artist will never be judged in the time of his time. Whatever judgment is delivered in the time of his time cannot be trusted. He did his work because he did not want to be useless. He did his work because he understood his potential to bring about great change. In closing, I am reminded of my grandmother's simple motto to her children and grandchildren, and she is 90 years young. Listen to learn and learn to listen. Instead of questioning the validity of one's experiences, even if these experiences are counter to your own experiences, one must do the work to engage in the act of listening first. It seems simple, but far too often we listen to respond as opposed to listening to understand. Whether positive or negative, in order for one to do the necessary work needed for equality and social change. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Reginald, would you like to address the question? that Sean made me think about that I flashed on at the beginning, especially talking about Baldwin and narrative, is um, the day that James Baldwin died, I was working as one of four assistant vice presidents uh, for the Uni Unisys Corporation in Pasadena, California. And it was another life for me, a life that was a world away from the life I have now, uh, a life that I absolutely um, I love the money. Um, I love the money. And I love the money. And there was nothing else good about that life at all. But there was one woman, her name was Eunice Davis, who was the only other black woman in a building of about 1,100 people. Um, she didn't report to me, she reported to one of my, my competitors' colleagues. And um, she was the one who always bailed me out because when I would come in, um, some lunch, and I took long lunches because Santa needed a racetrack was eight minutes from my office. Um, the, the security guards were rotating with all the searching. They you know, always asked, what are you doing here? Because I was coming in through the executive door. And on top of that, they always told me I'd be DW because it didn't belong to me sitting in the Mercedes. So I, kind of, I remember her. I had a great deal of affection for her, but I remember she walked all the way across the building, came to, came to my cubicle, called me out, and says, I just wanted you to know James Baldwin died, and I know you wouldn't want to hear it from any of these people. Oh. And I was like, okay. And then I knew I had to quit that job. I knew oh. I had to quit that job. Um, I do not view James Baldwin's work as a legacy. It has never been just an object or an artifact or even simply a foundational element to the canon of African American letters. You now I see his work, his life as a level. One that is artistic, one that is beautiful, one that is courageous, one that is necessary to pry off the veneer of quality and liberty and let us all have a good look at us and all of our complexity with all of our challenges. One of the reasons I'm so thrilled about the enhanced reissuing of this film, and I congratulate you on that as a gift, is that Baldwin's work has never been so necessary as right now. Yes. Yes. In a week where commentators and pundits are vilifying a group of black college athletes for holding their administration accountable for a toxic racial climate on their campus, his work is relevant. 
in a week where when two campus masters at our Ivy League campus down the street argue that blackface and sombreros are nothing more than a product of free speech and student fun, his work is necessary. When Baldwin characterized education, he said, the paradox of education is precisely this, that as one begins to become conscious, one begins to examine the society in which he is being educated. This was written over five decades ago, and it's our primary challenge and our fundamental opportunity. In the midst of the mad scramble of our lives between academic work, outside jobs, and responsibility of family, I know a lot of my students here have a lot of those things, and I respect you that you get your work. Um, Baldwin's fiction, his nonfiction, his drama, his poems provide us with a gorgeous and challenging way to better see ourselves and our country. One of his most important gifts is to illustrate the fallacy and separate the literary from the activist. Whether it be in his novels in other country or Giovanni's room, or his narratives Fire Next Time, or The Devil Finds Work, or in his plays Blues from Mr. Charlie. Baldwin crafts work that is beautiful, but it's in the framework of social justice. His work did not just speak to a particular culture or reflect a specific historical moment, but was part of that push to pull the come from the country as undergoing the difficult and tenuous process of expanding franchise and redefining liberty. I believe that one of the reasons this film and his work is so important is because we are in one of those fragile moments right now. And Baldwin's voice can provide some very complicated clarity at what it feels like for some of us a crucial turning point for our country. In one of his most important later works, Baldwin states, the world is before you and you need not take it or leave it as it was when you came in. I believe his works make it possible for all of us to do that, but by opening up this crucial window on ourselves and our lives. To address the question. Oh my. Well, I don't have anything written prepared, so um, I, I think the most shocking thing when I said about, first of all, maybe I'll tell you later, but I was working with James Baldwin while he was alive trying to make a film with him about the writing of his next book, and that's an important story, but to answer this question better, um, when I gradually was gathering all the archival footage from all over the world because we didn't have images of him alive, the statement that shocked me the most was probably when he says, well, as long as you insist on thinking you're white, I'm going to be forced to think I'm black. That hadn't occurred to me. And, um, you know, we aren't there yet. Uh, thanks to um, Melin Hines and the um, piece that you've all been given, I think, tonight, the excerpt of a letter to my nephew from A Fire Next Time, I reread that just very recently. In it, there's a line where Baldwin says, and he's writing this in 1963, and he says, we're, right now we're celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. And so, does this mean everything's solved and are we free? No, he says, it's really about 100 years too soon to celebrate it. He knew that how much work there was to be done. Well, now we're here, here we are 50 years later, and there's, almost feels as if there's more work to be done. There is definitely more work to be done, but it's, as you say, it's more crucial than ever. I think what he, his legacy, perhaps, he was forced, because of just that statement, as long as you think you're white, insist on thinking you're white, then I'm going to be forced to think I'm black. He was forced not just to bear witness for the black people who, in this hostile world where which thinks everything is white. He had to explain white people to white people. And in fact, what he really was doing, I believe, and this to me is his greatest legacy, he was explaining human beings to human beings. And if we can only get to that place, then we'll be better off. My training, uh, I'm a historian, so I, um, I address uh, the legacy of James Baldwin uh, as a historian. 
Uh, for me, uh, getting to know James Baldwin came in part uh, because of my life in Southwest Georgia, in this small rural area of Southwest Georgia, where um, I learned of James Baldwin from my older sister, who was a student at, at Morris Brown College. And so she began to take African American history courses at Morris Brown College, and she would get, get home for the break, Thanksgiving or Christmas break, she would bring her books along. And so she would pass a copy of uh, John O. Franklin's From Slavery to Freedom to me. Uh, then she would pass a copy of the autobiography of Malcolm X. And then finally she began to pass copies of Baldwin's work, Go Tell It on the Mountain and, and The Fire Next Time. So it, it became for me a, um, a historical learning experience. And so Baldwin for me, while he's a wonderful, wonderful uh, literary figure, he is also for me a historian. Uh, in part because uh, he is able to tell us what it's like to, uh, to be in an African-American church, what it's like to be in an African-American church where you experience the music, uh, glossolalia, you experience the leadership, you experience the rhythm and the movements of the people, and you also, through Baldwin's work, you feel the pain of being a young black man in America. And so for me, there's this historical Baldwin that I, 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 I love to, um, to read and talk about. And for me, he is one of the, uh, the race men. He is one of the, uh, the people who is part of the world of Paul Lawrence Dunbar, Richard Wright, Gwendolyn Brooks, and scores of other race men and women in black America. And as the Civil Rights Movement came along, he began to voice the fears, the anger, and the hopes of African Americans uh, in the country. Uh, he was part of Dr. King's nonviolent movement. Uh, he was part of Malcolm X's self-defense and black nationalism. And he traveled the deep south in the 1960s. Uh, he would go into uh, parts of Alabama, and in doing so, he would find himself uh, truly being part of the Civil Rights Movement, because you're not really part of the Civil Rights Movement, some of the old people in movement would argue, until you um, are on uh, J. Edgar Hooper's FBI list. And so, uh, he would make his way onto uh, J. Edgar Hooper's FBI list, and by 1973, when finally the FBI started not to take a look at him, they had amassed some 1,750 pages on the life of James Baldwin. So that's when you kind of know you've arrived in the Civil Rights Movement when you uh, were the head of the FBI. And in part, he had decided that he was going to write a, a book on the life of J. Edgar Hoover, basically uh, telling people like it is about, about the FBI uh, during the days of Hoover. So for me, for, for, for James Baldwin, he, uh, he plays a critical role uh, by telling the story of the African American church which is critical to the life of black people. He also tells about our literary traditions and links us to the past. Uh, in, in his fire the next time, for me, it was very much like uh, a, um, a modern day David Walker's appeal. I don't know if you've read Walker's appeal and you understand the passion and the power of it. The fire next time is like that for me as a youngster growing up in, in southern Georgia, really learning about um, the work of James Baldwin. And I'll, um, I'll close with this uh, about Baldwin. Uh, he, um, in essence, was what he was. Because he understood in terms of civil rights that it is what it is. And that racism is what it is. Continue the discussion, rather. Uh, I'm going to ask a follow-up question to get things started. But, um, you know, my style as moderator is to be as much a part of the conversation and just kind of disappear in the background. If anyone, if any of you feel as if you want to respond to something directly, don't wait for me to be able to direct you or my permission. Um, I actually want to begin with a question about education, um, which maybe is in your uh, bailiwick, Dr. Close, but um, certainly any of us can answer this. Um, uh, President Obama remarked at one point um, something along the lines, and I don't know if I have the quotation exactly, he said it's unacceptable that more black Americans would be in jail than in college. Conservative pundits immediately leapt on this and crunched their data and said it's not true. Uh, to me, amazingly missing the point that it was almost true, right? I mean, um, 
1.4 million black men enrolled in higher education uh, and a cataclysmic uh, three quarters of a million behind bars with another large sum on probation and parole. Uh, just a few more kind of grim statistics about this. 42% of black children are educated in high poverty schools. Only 6% of whites are. The unemployment rate for black high school dropouts, 47%. White high school dropouts, about half of that. One in three black men can expect to go to prison in their lifetimes. Um, the unemployment rate for college-educated blacks, for those who do go to college and get through and, and get their degrees, is double that of college-educated whites. And I don't, I don't raise these uh, uh, statistics to despair. I think we look to James Baldwin, um, you know, and everything he went through, and he declared, I, you know, I don't despair. We can't do that. Um, but my question is, uh, what is the work to be done uh, in this front? Um, I know that you're doing a lot of work in equity and diversity. Um, what are some things that need to be done uh, to help alleviate this situation? I, uh, I had the, uh, the pleasure of overhearing a, a conversation between my, my colleagues in the back, uh, uh, Dean Easley of Eastern and Dr. Eunice Matthews about social work program. Uh, a lot of what needs to be done uh, has to be done on a policy basis but it also has to be done in a very early time period because we, we know from statistics just in Connecticut, if you lose a, a child by the, by the second grade, you pretty much know where that child is going to wind up uh, because if we, we look at the children who are failing in the second grade in Connecticut, we pretty much know they're going to be part of our prison population. That's how early we know. We can calculate what our prison population is by the number of young people who are failing in second grade. I mean, that's critical, critical issue. Uh, we, we also uh, need, need to take a look at, uh, as the young people said, the young campus issues of systemic racism, uh, issues of uh, systemic poverty, uh, issues of sexism, all the issues that we need to take a look at in order uh, to work to end a lot of the things that, that go on here in the country. And I, I think uh, those places are good to begin, but it will take uh, a lot more than that. It will take a government committing itself to make change. And that commitment, um, some people will say, well, it, it's not possible. But there have been other commitments that have been made that clearly demonstrate that achievement can be, can be made in this area. Does anyone else want to address that question? I would just add a quote of James Baldwin's where this is, despite all of the negative statistics which are absolutely true and which we must face, he said that if you can change, even if only by a millimeter, the way people look at reality, then you can change the world. So all of us here, perhaps you have, perhaps, I don't know, how many here knew who James Baldwin was before the past week? And how many here have actually read some of James Baldwin's writing? Okay, well, take that, take whatever. I'd love to hear from people here what your takeaway is, but if you take that and you talk to other people, maybe by talking to them and finding out, reach out to difference and find out who they are and what they're about, and maybe start to find out what you have in common with each other instead of differences, just on a very immediate level, that will ripple out and ripple out and it will change the way people see reality because they might see you differently and you might see them differently and then it will change the world. Thank you. How many of you are considering uh, careers in education? It is. It's a tough field, and yet it is so. It's so important. Um, uh, PS um, PS twenty four, uh, where James Baldwin went, was a public school, and he had a, a very critical teacher there, Miss Miller. Her nickname was Bill. Bill Miller, uh, who introduced him to to theater, uh, who encouraged his writing. And uh, they reconnected in later years. And so we think of James Baldwin, I think, sometimes as sort of this self-taught autodidact. He didn't, amazingly, he did not have a college education. And yet he had some very, very critical 
um, education early on. And sometimes, as you were saying, uh, it's just a very small moment, small interaction. You know, we, uh, teachers go through their days and uh, it can be a small interaction, a small moment. You all have them probably. Memories of small moments in your education that made a big impact or a big difference. Um, uh, I'd like to, to move on to some other questions. Um, how many of you saw Black Li um, the uh, speaker, um, Ms. Garza, for Black Lives Matter today? How many of you know about the Black Lives Matters movement? Okay, good. Um, we have Black Lives Matters in response to that. There was a kind of a, an ongoing immediate backlash. Blue Lives Matters, uh, White Lives Matters, All Lives Matters. Um, uh, how do we work through that? Um, how does Baldwin maybe help us work through that? He said yes to life. I mean, he said yes to life, but he also said yes to love, and he also said yes to understanding the human condition and to understanding that human beings are human beings. And I think we need to go back to listening to one another. I think this is, and, and having open and honest conversations with one another, um, especially on um, kind of the intimate levels with your friends, with your family members, um, I try to engage with my students in, in creative writing to think about their characters as actual people who have complex situations and complex issues pertaining to race or their gender or sexuality. I think that's important to, to understand that, yes, it is, it is a larger issue, but there are, there's more to be done and you have to dig deeper. It's just not an easy thing to just say, all lives matter, when clearly in some ways it doesn't. If we, if we think about it, um, does, does our government really want all lives to matter in terms of poverty, in terms of um, the homeless epidemic that we're going through? We have to question this on, on a constant basis. One of the things I think that Baldwin does is, in his work and in his writing, and in, in what he called his secular sermons, the ones where he went around and spoke at churches, often churches that wouldn't acknowledge, acknowledge his whole self, the fact that he was gay, um, the fact that he was, had been in several long-term relationships with men, um, is he owned his anger, all right? He owned his anger. I think that it's, for many of us, I know for myself, it's extremely frustrating, you know, as somebody who grew up in Los Angeles under LAPD, under an all-white LAPD, that for the first time in my life, there's an honest and open conversation about the amount of black bodies that have been piled up in the streets yes. by police officers. Mm -hmm. And for the first time that's happening, and that there's a backlash about it. Yeah. You know, and, and you know, I mean, there was a, at, at school there was a, a, a banner across the police department uh, about, you know, all of a sudden there's all these national officers days, right? And, um, and it was extremely offensive. But at the same time, I think that one of the things that you learn from Baldwin is that you have to be, you have to articulate that, mm -hmm. right? That you, you cannot be afraid of your anger, but you have to make your anger matter. Mm -hmm. And that starts with being as candid and being as authentic about it as you can. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then you can start your engagement with the discussion. Mm -hmm. So he spoke about love, but it wasn't just sort of a, a love with an arrow through it and kind right. of high in the sky. It was love that contains rage, that contains courage to, to speak the truth to one another um, and, and not let each other off the hook. Right. I mean, it, I'm, I'm reminded of Audre Lorde who said, our silences will not protect us. Mm -hmm. And we, we really have to engage in that dialogue. But it's, it's interesting um, that Reginald said, um, he was talking about the, the national days for police officers. Um, it's, it's interesting because um, we're at a 40-year low for police officers who have been killed by civilians, but we're at a 20-year high for civilians who have been killed by police officers. And so that's something to just keep in mind when you're seeing all of the backlash, just put things into perspective a little bit more. For, for, for Baldwin, he helps us to, to, to understand, uh, as, as Dr. Flood talked about, the, the, the anger. 
uh, that existed. Uh, the, the anger of, of young people uh, is, is, is nothing new in, in American history. Uh, if you go back to the days of the, uh, the modern civil rights movement, it wasn't necessarily a, a northern anger that was there alone. There were people in the deep south who were angry as well. If you ask the people in, in Birmingham in 1965, they were angry. Having their churches bombed and four little girls dying, they would tell you they were angry as well. And if you go back and look at the archival footage. But in terms of what Baldwin does for us, he helps us to direct and focus what we're thinking about and to challenge people openly, and as Dr. Flood would say, honestly, about what's going on in the country. And Black Lives Matter uh, does do that. And they, they, they are, are a, an important voice in the discussion that continues to, be, to need, need to be made. I want to I make sure that we have uh, make room and uh, allow and invite any audience members who have questions or statements to make to come up to the microphone. Uh, I know that when we talk about race relations, which is so important, it's also hard to do when people feel like maybe you're picking up a couple of live wires. Um, but I, I look around this around this room, and I know that uh, I know that we're we're going to have a respectful conversation like we're having right now, um, like Baldwin, you know, giving the best of who we are. So, is there anyone who would like to step or, up to the microphone? And or even, I'll give up my mic if we can pass it around if people don't want to get up. Sure, I'm, we could do that too if you don't want to. So wireless mics. Thanks, Karen. <clears throat> Hi everyone, um, my name is Randy Sanders, I'm the coordinator at Quinnabaca Community College at our Romantic Center. And I really do appreciate this event and our guest speakers and panelists um, for having this event. Um, I expressed this a little bit on our Danielson campus, I believe, yesterday. But I didn't get to say this. Um, uh, growing up, I grew up in a wall white town and uh, going through school systems, going to college and through high school also. I, I was ashamed and disappointed in our education system that for, for me and my wife, who is, is uh, Ecuadorian, we were never exposed to James Baldwin. Um, Dr. Close is here today, but I, while you're here, I need to apologize, but I did register for your class at Eastern a couple times and it dropped it. But um, <laughs> I... That's really why you came here. <laughs> but looking at the panels, I'm extremely proud. I don't know you well at all, but I'm extremely proud of what I see tonight. But going back to my experiences, I do feel a little bit of disappointment in our education system that uh, I was not exposed to James Baldwin as I should have been. And now that I'm here tonight, I'm extremely proud of the students that came out on a Thursday night to be here and participate. But to um, discuss more on that is, as I look around the crowd, there are some great people here tonight, but as I also look around, I don't see as many minority students that should be here tonight to hear this and to receive this message and bring it further, because you really are the next generation, and to speak on this more, um, and bring this further, because at some point, the panelists will move on and go on and continue to do some great things, but we need a younger generation to step up more and hear this message and read more about James Baldwin and other authors uh, about this topic. Um, but I do appreciate you all being here tonight. Um, and for this, my point about students, great job. And we will continue this message on throughout the school year and beyond. Thank you. But um, does, does someone want to maybe address that question? Why do you think there aren't more um, uh, minority students, black students, students of color here? Or, to put it another way, students of color, black students who are here, why are you here? The ways of approaching this. Does anyone want to address that topic? <laughs> Hello, my name is Lamira Simeon. Um, I'm here because I was invited by uh, 
social worker here. I run two alternative schools here in Mount Manning. Um, at first, I wasn't sure what I was coming to. She invited me in the process of me, you know, working out something else for some students here. And um, I was glad that I came because in the last three weeks, things have been a little tough for me. I also live in a community where my children, I chose to move from New London and take them to East Line. We're going to live in Niantic. And um, sometimes I wonder if that's a mistake. So recently, there was a um, um, homecoming, there was a homecoming event. Make a long story short, some students came um, dressed up, looking like, as they said, they called themselves rednecks or hicks. Um, in that community of East Lyme, we represent, we being black, 2% of the community. So my daughter and um, my son, you know, as they're telling me the situation of what happened, you know, I feel like, okay, all the, you know, as, they as they're telling me who was in the office for an incident that occurred where these students actually took a rope and put it around a student's neck was a prank. And my daughter said to the young man who they did it to, that was not okay. I'm going to let someone know. Now granted, the young man probably felt uncomfortable when you stand in a crowd and there's no one, not that many people that look like you. How do you stand up against, you know, the guys who are the, you know, the, the best players on the lacrosse team, the soccer team, you know, when you live in a town where team sports is the big thing and your parents maybe donated money here and there and that's what speaks. So my daughter goes to the principal and speaks to him about the matter and talks about her struggle. Here she is a senior and she's saying, I can't believe that this happened. I can't believe that these are seniors who are going to be graduating and they thought that that was okay and that you're calling it a prank. This is not okay in 2015. They then ask my daughter, do you feel safe? Do you feel okay? No one contacts me for a good couple of days because now it's out. People have posted it on social media and they're concerned about the backlash. So they finally do contact me and I had to tell the principal, granted I'm a principal as well, I know you're busy, but I wish you'd let me know what was going on and you ask me about my daughter who still lives in my house if she feels safe. But also, in 2015, we really do need to talk about this topic. So as we, like, I have a son who has to be there for another two years. How do I make sure he doesn't go through that? You know, how do we make sure that other kids coming up in communities that are, you know, where, where you know, there is not a large majority of you know minorities there. To make sure that parents know as they're responding to this situation, they're saying, what's the big deal? What do you want us to do? And I'm like, how big do I make this? I know it wasn't my child that it happened to, but it could have been my child. You know, this is not okay. You know, this could happen again. And how do we stop it? So we had a conversation at a meeting and I thought it was to solve the problem. And then found out the speaker that was there had no idea about the incident that occurred. And I said, wait, wait a minute. Um, like, let's really, we, we have to educate not only our students in the schools, because the schools do their part, but the families, we need to get the parents out, you know, and make sure the parents know that, you know, they're, they're their children's first teachers. And in many ways, you know, some of the kids in the community I live in, their parents talk a certain way and act a certain way, and these kids think it's okay to behave in the way that they may have behaved. The parents saw the kids leaving the house in these outfits, and there was also a Confederate flag involved in the pickup truck. So all of this is, it was a mock lynch, and they said it was a prank. I said, no, this is bigger than that, you know? And then shortly after I did find out something else happened, and I think Litchfield, Connecticut, that kind of mirrored the same thing. So I was, I'm here because, you know, this is a topic that we do need to talk about in 2015, and all lives do matter, you know. We all need to, you know, be working together, getting along, and, you know, changing. This is, it's been a long time. If you think about the years that you're mentioning, and, you know, Ball was, you know, talking about his experience, and now we're still dealing with some of the same things. It's ridiculous, you know. Thank you very much.
but it was white students against white students. So it might be different that white lives matter more than a prank. It wasn't looked at as a prank. So that's interesting to look at, because if it's against a black student, it's, it's a prank. But if it's against a white student, I want to thank you for that story. Um, for those of us in the audience who hadn't known that it happened, and for you to witness. Um, and I'd like to speak as a white person, because I think we have something to gain from uh, an event like this. And yes, there should be more minority people here. But we really need those of us who have grown up with white privilege. It's in the air we breathe. We have no experience of the kind this mother described her son going through. And uh, it's so tempting to uh, just let it be invisible. You know, it's, it is the air we breathe. There's a book by uh, Robert Jensen called The uh, Heart of Whiteness. I recommend to anybody who kind of hasn't had some pivotal event happen in their lives that really uh, illuminated uh, that, that privilege. I can't think of any way to say it more vividly as a, as a white person, but let's just listen to, to all the people of all color that are holding forth with their, uh, their personal experiences. I want to personally salute your daughter for having had the courage to recognize that this wasn't a prank and to tell about it because obviously peer pressure, all the things that go on in high school, it's not easy to speak out about anything, but to this level and without, you know, despite whatever repercussions might follow, first of all, that's an extraordinary act of courage. I want to tell a smaller story. I'll try and condense it because it's an example of someone doing something about something like this. And it's part of what you're saying, sir, um, about listening to each other. Um, we had a, an event like this at Hartford Public High School and, and basically in an inner city school and the population of the school is 50% black, 50% Latino and 10% and immigrant. So the math isn't right, but it's the, uh, it's the mix. And so um, we had on our panel a woman, a wonderful woman named Candida Flores, and she talked about how she and her granddaughter were having lunch in a, in a, in a diner, and um, behind us, behind her rather, I wasn't there, were a pair of white women who were talking about their distress with the, the waitress, and then they asked to see the supervisor, and then they were distressed because the supervisor was also Hispanic, and they were just voicing their disgust. And Candida Flores and her granddaughter are of Latino extraction. And so, you know, what would you do in this situation? Here's what she did. She said, my dear, to her granddaughter, pick up your plate. She went around the booth and sat down next to the two white women and began a conversation and told her story of immigration and education. This woman now is... Um, she has a master's, she's a social worker, she does extraordinary work with the immigrant community in Hartford. But apparently their conversation went on for about an hour and a half and they, they exchanged how to stay in touch. And first of all, the granddaughter, having heard these slur, slurs, was shown, okay, there is something you can do and it doesn't have to be aggressive. And the white women learned something. And I just thought, wow. What a way to handle something. So I think your daughter's on that path. Yes, Rose. Good evening, and thank you for having this opportunity. I'm Rose Reyes. I'm the what's left of the bilingual education program at Women Center Elementary School. I am the bilingual certified teacher. Hi. Um, and as a woman of color, um, I can understand why other people of color are not here. There's enough um, in terms of uh, layers and layers of stress, that when we are in these um, opportunities, perhaps there's a re-stimulation and a, um, a desire to avoid some work at the moment. Um, but in this town, we have an issue of the systematic um, undereducating 
of our children of color, especially children who happen to be emergent bilinguals. That was, that was the biggest issue when the special master came into play, right? This, these are systematic, systemic approaches of control. So, this, so if you're disappointed about your education, it was planned. It was planned. It's planned to be like that because, because for this capitalist system to thrive, they need a surplus pool of workers, right? That's your basic understanding of capitalism. However, the piece that is um, causing that uh, post-traumatic stress so much is one simple example. Every day I drive through um, Tucky Road and remember the uh, Confederate flag situation. I now encounter, there's two, not one but two. And every day I drive and I have to make a decision. Do I continue to go to work? Or do I plot something? <laughs> right? Right? And is it worth is it worth the ramifications? Right? I mean, will I go down in history as someone like being brave or courageous? Or <clears throat> am I am I being baited? And these are the these are the thoughts that people of color wake up with every day because we are in battle. It doesn't change. It hasn't changed. The system has gotten more wicked. The uh, no offense, the older white men are scared because this nation is browning. Our public education system has browned. Our teachers don't reflect our, our students. Now we're, now we're labeling the students. We're investing in more interventions as opposed to certain educational approaches that are just culturally relevant and significant. There is no ethnic studies anywhere in this quiet corner of Connecticut. There are children who are learning vast, vast amounts of Western history, right? No sense of themselves. So how can we expect them to be of themselves? Thank you for your time. question. You know, as I followed up on Randy and asking the question, why there aren't more students here, that I felt was part of the answer. Right? I mean, this is, this is a really traumatic um, experience for some people who have been through this, been through this, been through this again, and it always is the burden of the person of color, the minority, to be the educator of the person who's white and doesn't have, uh, either is racist or, or, or is just ignorant of, of, uh, of those experiences. Um, Sorry, Dad, we need a collective response to those two flags, okay? Let me know. Give me yeah. some yeah. 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 I'm like five steps. Sarah Ellis, did you want to speak? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Sarah Ellis. I'm from Cornwall Community College. I'm here in the Romantic Campus. Um, I came here because my professor announced me the event since the beginning of the semester. And I was quite interested. You draw my attention the most with the question, why are more, um, most minorities here? I, mean, I apologize in advance, English is not my first language. I am a bilingual student, I come in from Puerto Rico, and I want to say right now that our system in education is not at its finest. We do not get presented wonderful people like James Baldwin. We get presented, you know, white history, to be honest. We don't learn about these people. We're under rules and rules and rules, and that's all we see. We're under this system, and we don't get this freedom of expression. And when I come here and I see all this freedom of expression that the United States presents, it's, it just blows my mind away. I take an internship at um, Charter, um, Charter TV station, and I have to go to through Chucky Road, right? And I see those flags too. It does offend me very, very much. So probably one of the reasons why there's not many minority students here is because we're not informed. Not informed of the activity, but not informed of the importance of what is people like James Baldwin. One question to the panel. Um, because uh, Eastern, we have buses that are that are waiting, um, and uh, it, it's kind of a question of conclusion. Uh, we talked about how Baldwin insisted on love and hope, 
but that he wasn't being facile about either. That both were going to involve a lot of hard work and hard conversations. Uh, in 1963, he wrote about this, uh, concluding, and my, you heard my Angelo actually uh, read part of this. Um, he said, if we, and now I mean the relatively conscious whites and the relatively conscious blacks, do not falter in our duty now, we may be able, handful that we are, to end the racial nightmare and achieve our country and change the history of the world. It was a, it was a message of urgency. That was 1963. This is 2015. Um, where, is the, where is the hope? What, what do we turn to? How do, how do we make sure that we do not uh, turn to despair? I, I think it, it, it's where um, Baldwin and a lot of other people found the hope uh, in um, the, uh, the voices of young people uh, who um, maybe um, wasn't in anger or rage, but still uh, there's hope often in, in that anger and, and in that rage. Uh, you can also find it in dedicated teachers, dedicated professors who are willing uh, to uh, speak truth to power uh, when they are often challenged in terms of what they do. Uh, you can also find it in terms of mothers and fathers who go out of their way uh, to uh, make sure that in terms of their education that it, it, it means spending a lot of late hours or extra duties on their jobs to make sure that their children have the supplies that they need in their classrooms. So things of that nature, while they're small in nature, it can have a huge, huge impact uh, on, on the lives of, of, of young people and also on the nation. Um, just really briefly, one of the things, think about what shape James Baldwin might well help shape the next generation. Um, the tor torch has certainly passed the next generation, but what he said is, it was books that taught me. When he read and, and realized he was reading Dickens, he was reading Dostoevsky, he was reading Henry James, and he was learning about suffering on a human level. He wasn't thinking about black suffering or white suffering at that point, or Latino, or any uh, particular kind of, of gender discrimination. He was just reading human stories. We're back to the narratives where you began, Sean. In a way, that, that spoiled him from the very beginning, because he never lost that consistency. Whether he was famous or out of favor, popular or unpopular, he, the amazing thing we learned when we could make this film, I think, is one of the many ways that James Baldwin can finish his own sentence 20 years apart. He didn't flinch. He never lost that belief in humanity and what we have in common instead of what we have different. So to me, there's the hope, his example. And so keep reading and um, find out all we have in common and then keep talking and keep listening. you have to keep reading. I think sometimes you have to turn off your television sets and watch news that is different than what you're going to hear. Watch the BBC. Watch Al Jazeera. Watch something different. Try to immerse yourself in another culture. Choose films that are on topics that you're uncomfortable with. Choose documentaries that you're uncomfortable with. Choose books you're uncomfortable with. I read Mein Kampf by Adolf Hitler in the German. I was uncomfortable with it. German was my first language, so I'll just put that out there. Um, but I was uncomfortable with it. But I read it because I have to understand a different perspective. If I can only understand my perspective, I'm in a tunnel. <laughs> Thank you.